Great. So thank you very much uh, for including me uh, in this program. Um, let me start uh, by giving you a sense of uh, what sorts of risks I'm going to talk about that are facing um, emerging markets today that are coming from, that I can speak to from my, my recent research drawing on, on some work I've been doing with uh, Antonio Coppola, Matteo Maggiore, uh, and Brent Nyman. So in particular, I'm going to highlight um, two kind of sources of fragility that are facing emerging, mar emerging markets when they're receiving um, you know, basically foreign investment today. So first, I'm going to talk about the extent to which when emerging markets and developing economies borrow from foreign investors, they actually do so by borrowing through offshore tax havens like the Cayman Islands. And so in particular, um, there's actually going to be kind of one, one benefit of, of Adrian reference, the, the Lucas paradox. I'm actually going to show you that more capital is flowing to emerging markets than you would see from official statistics. And the reason for that is you know, basically 15% of United States foreign investment goes to tax havens like the Cayman Islands. Um, you know, from my work, you can actually see that a lot of that is actually going to emerging markets. So in fact, a little bit more or significant amount more is flowing uh, through tax havens. However, that does raise a number of additional concerns. For instance, uh, the opacity of the investment, uh, the lack of oversight, um, and just more generally that it's very difficult to measure the exposures of uh, different emerging markets. I'm also going to talk about uh, a second risk, which is the extent to which um, emerging markets borrow in foreign currency. So many of you may be familiar with um, the recent uh, change over the last 15 years that many emerging market governments have actually begun borrowing from foreign investors in their own currency. Uh, this is seen as a very positive development um, because if you think of the, the crises in, in, the, in the 1990s and going back further, much of that was blamed on the fact that emerging market governments had actually borrowed in foreign currency. And so why is that dangerous? Because if a government has borrowed in foreign currency in a recession or a panic, you would expect the currencies of developing or emerging markets to depreciate. And so it's exactly in the times when governments are least able to make a payment that the real cost of servicing their debt is going to balloon in foreign currency. Because that means that when your currency depreciates, any dollar that you've borrowed is going to be more and more painful to pay back. And so what you see is that it looks like governments have really learned their lessons from the late 1990s, and many emerging markets, have be, governments have begun borrowing overwhelmingly in their local currency. However, what I'm going to show you is that coupled with that you know, switch to local currency borrowing by the government, the private sector, when they borrow abroad, is still overwhelmingly indebted in foreign currency. And so in terms of how much flexibility um, developing economies have in terms of depreciating their exchange rate, if you just look at what the governments are doing, it might look you know, fairly easy to allow your currency to depreciate in bad times. But if your firms have all borrowed in dollars, the government may find itself a bit more constrained uh, than it thought. Now, I'm also going to talk a little bit about how these two forces, um, this tax haven effect and this foreign currency, actually go together. Because in the aggregate, I'm going to show you that um, if you just look at official statistics, um, a country as a whole, emerging markets as a whole, look like they're significantly less indebted in dollars than they were you know, a little bit more than a decade ago. However, because official statistics are missing all of the borrowing in the Cayman Islands that their firms are doing, and all of that borrowing is in dollars, in fact, firms have become more and more, accounting for more and more of the cross-border lending that's being done by emerging economies. And so what you can see is that the switch to local currency might be smaller than, than you would think. Let me jump in and give you a sense of um, how much cross-border statistics can actually be distorted when we look at the so-called residency basis. So the way that um, international statistics are calculated, you know, what makes something a cross-border investment, it's actually when money crosses a border from one entity to another. And it doesn't matter when we actually record an investment. It's not about the ultimate parent, generally. Uh, it's about the immediate issuer. And so if you look at what national statistics would say, what share of foreign investment of these major uh, developed markets, Australia, Canada, Switzerland, Denmark, the Euro area, Great Britain, Norway, Sweden, and the US, what fraction of that investment is going to China, you'd see a very small amount. You, know, you could think of this as the Lucas paradox that Adrian highlighted. However, if you look on a nationality basis, what you can actually see is that roughly 10% of American investment is going to China. Now, what is the nationality basis and why is this adjustment? 
If you think of your own kind of retirement accounts, I'm assuming that most of you, you know, through an index fund or otherwise, would be invested in Tencent or Alibaba. As far as national statistics go, that is an investment in a Cayman Island-based shell company. And that will count as you investing in the Cayman Islands. And when you look at you know, national statistics, like the US Treasury and National Capital Data, or the IMF Coordinated Portfolio Investment Survey, that's going to look as if you're lending to a tax haven, not investing in China. And so this nationality basis, what that's doing is essentially mapping every single security issued in a tax haven to the ultimate parent who issued it. Now, returning to this idea of debt financing, to eventually turn back to the currency composition, I want to show you that this adjustment can be nearly as large for uh, how much money is flowing into emerging market debt. So on a residency basis, again, that's the immediate issuer, what you'll see is only around 2% of developed market foreign investment is going to the so-called BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. But on a nationality basis, for the US, this can be around 7%. So that means is you know, a roughly almost a threefold increase um, when you consider all of the debt that's being raised by um, the firms in these economies offshore. So how exactly is this happening? And so let me just show you a little map of how exactly Petrobras, uh, the Brazilian oil giant, is actually going to raise money from uh, US and American investors. So our data set is gonna cover the, the universe of mutual funds, so retail investors um, across 10 countries. And what we can actually see is that none of their portfolio is actually going to go directly into Petrobras in Brazil. Instead, all of the investment is going to be in bonds issued by Petrobras International Financing Corporation in the Cayman Islands, or Petrobras Global Finance, or Petrobras Global Trading in the Netherlands. And so this allows Petrobras to tap international debt markets, but without, you know, say, um, you know, filing all the kind of regulatory disclosure you might expect if you issue in New York. And um, in terms of judging just how much debt Brazil has, according to national statistics, this is all going to be investment in the Cayman Islands and uh, in the Netherlands, even though everyone buying these bonds is thinking about an investment in Brazil, because these are nothing but financing shells. No actual economic activity is occurring here. Now, with that, let me turn to my second point of highlighting the extent of currency mismatch um, and the currency denomination of debt in emerging markets. So these, um, this is the data for 2017 um, of what share of sovereign external debt, so any borrowing from foreign investors, um, is actually in each country's local currency. And so this graph, you know, yes, there's some heterogeneity, but the fact that a majority of foreign borrowing by sovereigns is done in local currency is a massive change uh, from the 1990s. And so this is the sense in which um, you can think that many countries find themselves in a, in a more flexible situation that you know, a depreciation doesn't necessarily cause an increase in the sovereign's indebtedness. But as this massive change has happened in uh, the sovereign sector and the sovereign has been borrowing abroad in local currency, in red, you can actually plot what share of um, corporate debt of the, you know, the firms in these countries is actually in local currency. And so even though what you see is uh, the government tapping international capital markets in local currency, the firms in emerging markets, when they borrow a, uh, from abroad, it's almost entirely in, um, in foreign currency, predominantly in um, US dollars. Now, <clears throat> How did these two facts, this reliance on tax havens and this dichotomy between how firms and sovereigns borrow, kind of come together to potentially change our sense of you know, how vulnerable or you know, the currency composition of the country as a whole would actually change? So on the left, I'm going, to look, I'm going to kind of dig into the example of Brazil. If you look at national statistics, so this would be um, if you look at the treasure, you know, just what's reported as uh, rich world investment in um, you know, Brazil as a whole, in red, that's the residency basis. And this is what you would see in the official statistics as a big you know, cause for, for celebration. That basically since 2007, you could see that, uh, whereas it used to be only 40% of Brazil's external debt were in real, the local currency, as of 2017, what you would see is that 80% of Brazil's external debt would be in local currency. However, in blue, this is what 
know, we kind of believe is, the, is closer to the, the economically relevant measure, what fraction of that debt would be denominated in the real, in real on a nationality basis? And what you can see is that you know, it's a much smaller increase, closer to 45 or 50 percent, than if you looked at national statistics. And so why would this be the case? What accounts for the adjustment? Well, on the right panel, you can plot what share of Brazil's external borrowing, so any borrowing from foreigners, is done by firms. And so if you look at the red line, what you'll see is by 2017, that number is significantly below 10%. So if you look at national statistics, which are really going to be overwhelmingly capturing, is the sovereign. And that's, again, because, according to national statistics, all of that borrowing being done by Petrobras uh, in the Caymans or other firms being done, you know, doing, being done in tax havens is not going to count as a liability of Brazil. When you correctly account for the idea that much of this tax haven issuance is being done by these emerging market firms, the corporate sector's role increases dramatically. And so because they're still borrowing in foreign currency, the country as a whole is much more exposed to foreign currency than you might have thought. Now, the last thing I want to discuss is how much can we expect this to change going forward? You know, what prospects are there for uh, firms in emerging markets and developing countries to actually borrow in their own currency? And I'm, I must admit I'm going to add a little bit skeptically because uh, this is the plot of the currency composition of external portfolios of uh, you know, G10 or uh, developed markets. So what you can see is for uh, many of these uh, developed economies, you basically have this exact same dichotomy, that the sovereign is overwhelmingly borrowing in the local currency, you know, nearly entirely, but firms when they borrow from foreign investors, are overwhelmingly borrowing in foreign currency. There's one massive exception over there, which is the United States, which is, as the issuer of the international currency, one of the ways in which the US stands out most dramatically is that American firms, when they borrow from foreigners, are doing so in dollars. And I think when discussing the prospects of many uh, you know, developing and emerging economies to borrow on their own currency, I think a lot of the inference for how likely that can be is coming from this US experience, that a lot of the borrowing can be done in, in your own currency. But even when you look at, say, a country like Canada, you know, less than 10% of Canadian external bond portfolios is going to be in the Canadian dollars. And so I think um, what we see a lot in cross-border investment is that investors appear to be heavily uh, segmented by currency. And so you see a very surprising, surprisingly low willingness of investors to take on any currency risk. Now, I think there's, you know, there's likely a very big difference between this external um, currency composition of emerging and developed economies, which is that many of the firms in developed markets we might expect to be hedging these exposures uh, using liquid derivative markets. It's far less likely that emerging market firms are doing the same. And so I think that a lot of time, um, you know, the hope is how can emerging markets and developing uh, economies switch their external borrowing into their own currency, I think that unfortunately, frequently, what you can actually see is the way to reduce currency mismatch is often to reduce the reliance on foreign debt financing, that almost as a condition of receiving debt financing from abroad, it's very likely to be um, in uh, foreign currency. Um, and so with that, I want to thank you all for, for listening.